Gary, Gary. welcome to the show. It's wonderful yeah. to have you here today. Thanks. It's great to be here. I'm really excited about our topic. We first met when you were doing and holding the meditation session, and since then we spoke, and you told me that you work with helping people to unlock their inner artist. I'd love you to sort of explain what you mean by unlock your inner artist and why that's an important topic for you. Sure. sure. So, so for me, I feel, I feel like, like um, inside, inside of us, we have uh, an inner artist, some people may call it the inner child, or um, a, a, a part of us that really is genuinely playful, that really appreciates the world around us. And it's from that point that we actually see the most important things for us. I mean, in, in general, like, you know, we can think about, let's say, um, regular intelligence. Uh, we can talk about emotional intelligence, which is super important. But when we think about, let's say, the idea of um, artistic intelligence, it's a little bit about the things that we surround ourselves with, you know, the colors that we appreciate, the forms and shapes, the buildings that we live in. All that is an expression of our inner artist, I think. And so I think that when we're more aware of that, then we start to become able to discern what things we want more of in our lives. Hmm. That's kind of the idea. I, I love it. And I've never heard the term artistic intelligence. I, that's the first time I hear this. Yeah. When did this become a topic for you? When did you s first start to be interested in this? So I've been um, an artist for a long time, a, a visual artist, painter and filmmaker. And um, always, you know, whenever anyone's asked, oh, where do you get your ideas? Or um, how do you, you know, become an artist? Or um, what is it that's most important to express? Um, or what do you find your, how do you find your voice? And so I started to um, especially meditate a lot and to get into the kind of esoteric world of, of yoga and Sufism and all this kind of stuff. And I realized that there has been a tradition of kind of diving deep into yourself and then expressing yourself more and more clearly. And I thought, oh, these two are linked together. And so this idea of um, artistic intelligence came to me as like an idea that I should pursue be because I felt like, you know, um, the things that make a difference in our lives are mostly either the emotional things or the artistic things, you know, otherwise everything would look exactly the same. We wouldn't care, right, about what colors we had on or anything like that. But we do. Of course, we, we do care. That makes a huge impact to our lives. I have so many questions that came to me in, in one go. One of them was, how do we find our voice, which we might get back to later. But the other one that I'm thinking is, why do we suppress our artistic nature? Because I think in today's society, it's a lot about reasoning and rationalizing and prefrontal cortex activities. And we have a tendency to not look or ignore or push away. What's that about? So I think there's... Um in general, a kind of push towards, if we want to call it success. And so we feel like we have to pursue um, money as an abstract thing. And most of us don't even really, e really even appreciate money, I think, and certainly don't know about the mechanics of actual how money works and everything like that. But we have been sold this idea, like we have to make money, we have to make money. And actually, I don't know if that's necessarily really true. Um, to make uh, a good life, do we need, yeah, we need money, but do we need to have money in itself? Or is it obviously the things that we can buy with the money and all the ways that we can utilize it? So I think that we're, we've fooled ourselves um, into believing that other things are important. When actually, if we start thinking about it, you know, it's like when you go into a shop and you're choosing between different things, you choose the one that appeals to you. Now there's a whole marketing system that's been based on building up kind of like helping you to make choices and sort of driving you one direction or the other. And we're kind of suckers for that color, form, all these kind of things that make up product. Um, and that is all art, really, or at least artistic expression. So those people who are designing products, who are designing, you know, the packaging and the marketing, they are thinking about how to grab your attention. And that's your artistic eye that's being grabbed. So we are surrounded by art, we just don't realize it. Exactly, yeah. We are basically surrounded by this stuff all over the place. And the things that we prefer, we prefer because of the way that they look, because of the way that they smell, like perfume making is artistic, right? It's all, yeah, so it's all that kind of stuff, yeah. So it's more prevalent than we give ourselves credit for, and we should appreciate this stuff. And then the people who do, they have nicer stuff around them and then they get you know they 
snowball effect in a positive way too. This is so interesting because this makes me reflect that I think sometimes when my creativity is slightly repressed or if I put it differently, if I'm not engaging in creative activities that I normally do, mm. such as music and writing, and then I feel that I want to shop. And I think <laughs> it's a creative... Sometimes I go in a shop or a bookshop and I look at all the books everywhere and it looks so beautiful and it appeals to my visual senses, sometimes auditory, depends where we are, which shopping place, and then the colors. And I think it's exactly this. And I'd never seen it that way. Mm. I'd always thought I just need a dopamine kick oh, and yeah, I'm yeah. not getting it from being in flow and doing an activity and I have this urge to shop. Of course, I don't actually shop a lot because it's... Does it, it doesn't work. Yeah, it's not <laughs> it, sustainable, right? No, it's not sustainable, <laughs> but also you just get a dopamine hit and then what next? You just want to buy more stuff and there's no point. But it's more, I, I noticed this urge. So I'm, I'm thinking it's probably also this creativity that sometimes is repressed. And I'm wondering if sometimes you have this, for instance, if you feel that you're not nurturing your creativity, how does this come out? Where do you feel it sort of goes? Um. If we're not nurturing our creativity, I agree, I go shopping too. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> yeah, especially, you know, like you can buy lots of stuff, right, online and you just go for it, don't you? Like you're thinking, oh, I'm bored, I need to buy something, I need some kind of like impulse. But it, I think what your point is really though, is that sometimes we separate uh, being creative or being a creator from being uh, an inner art, from our inner artist. And I think that they don't have to be separated, but they could be. So some of us might have like a, you know, um, an impulse to do something creative. And that's, that's one thing and we need to get ideas and we need to formulate how we think and everything like that. Um, and then that turns us into some form of art, whatever it might be. And other, others of us don't need that, but we still have this inner artist that has preferences and all this kind of stuff. And to increase that creativity, we could do something as simple as, you know, go to a store where we find ourselves, you know, filled with different possibilities. And that could open up our eyes, of course. Um, any kind of, you know, there's a, there's a book called The Artist's Way, which has been around for a long time. Um, and it's a great um, kind of workbook for kind of working with your inner artist. And one of the things that, that she talks about in this book is finding an artist date, making an artist date where you go to a museum uh, on your own and you, or you go to some kind of inspirational thing or it could even be a bookshop or what you, places that people te might tend to go are these like, um, not art supplies, but you know these kind of party supply things where there's all kinds of colors and spangles and sparkles and you're just like, whoa, you know, I am getting kind of, you know, this feeling that I might have only had when I was a child or whatever, yeah. Mm. Yes, I thought we probably would touch on the artist way, talking about oh releasing right, yeah. your inner yeah. artist. <laughs> I thought this comes up, and I think we spoke about it when we met last time. All right, maybe, yeah. Yeah, and I definitely used the morning pages, writing those three pages every morning yeah. when I was working on my book, and it really helped me. Yeah. But I didn't do the inner, the artist date. I don't oh know. Right. I didn't have any ideas, but I, I think both of them are very interesting. And I actually bore her... An, another book of hers recently on writing, ah, more right. specifically for, for writing, which I think is interesting. Yeah, the morning pages are fantastic. I mean, you know, if you start to work through, it's this free writing, basically for the people who don't know, you get up in the morning and you write without thinking, three pages, longhand, straight out, and then you don't look back at them, right? You're just letting yourself out. Uh, and that's fantastic because it just gets away all this stuff, you know? Yes, and it, I don't know, a lot of things happen when you do that. First of all, you get clearer in your thoughts and your ideas. Then it also unblocks, it helped me not have writer's block because then when I was writing, you sort of relax that and you, you learn to not be judgmental about the writing that you're doing. Yep. And so because you're just writing anything and you're not judging yourself, yep. that really helps. Um, okay, I want to go back to that initial question I had earlier. Right. So when people ask you, how can I find my voice? What do you recommend them to be more in tune with their inner artist? All of the things that have to do with artistry, I think come from a desire to do something. So for you, it might be like, let's say writing that book. For someone else, it might be uh, making their garden, whatever it is. And so when you have a kind of a vision for any anything like that, then um, you inevitably need 
the materials and supplies to make that become something. And I think that the best thing is to actually find something that you want to do. And it's through making whatever it might be, either a book or a garden or whatever, um, that you then start to see more of what you want to make. So I actually believe that it's in the doing that the thing is revealed. Um, I, there are some, obviously some basic tools like, you know, your journaling, which is a, the artist of the uh, pages is a way of journaling or meditating or things like that, that kind of help us settle in to um, uh, find out what we want. But for those of us who have meditated, um, and I've meditated a lot, and I never, very rarely anyway, get this voice that says, you should do this, right? It just doesn't come. You know, you meditate and it's like, no voice. And I'm like, oh, can't you just answer? Please, I'm praying for this answer. And the answer is in the doing, often, I think. So I think it's do something, whatever it might be. If you have an inspiration that you want to, one of my uncles, he used to do these like, uh, pencil shavings and turn them into art and then through the process of building that up I could see he just became more expressive and it was nice that and it was gave him something to do that he could talk about that then was an outlet for his you know artistic expression so yeah, I think it's the doing of something and then you find materials and you find the learnings that are necessary um, the whole yogic philosophy is based on that there's this idea in uh, in yoga that you know, most of our learning um, in, before I get to the yoga thing, most of our learning is uh, additive in the West, right? So two plus two is four, four plus two is six. Then we have the multiplication tables, division, it goes on with calculus and all this kind of stuff. In the yogic tradition or in these ancient philosophies, they start with the end. They say, you are it. You are the divine center of everything. And then the questions begin. I'm it, but I don't feel like I'm it. How do I feel that? What do I need to do? How do I get there? And I think that, let's say, these physicists like Richard Feynman or these people who have these like uh, visions for creating, or Einstein, right? They start with a vision or a big question. And that question then drives the learning. And I think it's the same with the artistry, right? So if you start to have questions, how does this work? You start to find out, you pull in the information and the techniques that you need to get there. I think. I was thought with the doing, and we were just talking about Kobe and be proactive. Oh, right, yeah. Taking yeah, action, exactly. doing it, and as yeah. you do it. What is your definition of art and being artistic? Because the way you're defining it now, pulling information to, or not information, but pulling in things and doing things to create something, I think is not what people think of if they think of creativity or art. Do you see a difference mm. between creativity and art? Yeah, it's funny. I was having a conversation with um, another artist, a very successful one, on the way here on the phone. And what she was saying to me was, you know, there's a big difference between this kind of like creative stuff, right, and art. And, and I was saying, yeah, I totally agree with you. And the point that she was making was that there is a space for play, right, for just like, getting out a canvas and throwing paint on it, being, you know, uh, spontaneous and all that kind of stuff. And then there is something that comes from a deeper level of connection and thinking and uh, awareness. It doesn't have to be more sophisticated, but it usually involves some kind of, let's say, uh, skill or uh, commitment. And that's when we step into, let's say, something that we could label as art even though the other stuff might be creative you know a kid splashing paint you know might be creative might be art but then if an adult is just splashing paint at what point does it become art right we see some art that w they work with it so much that it becomes something different you know maybe that's because of the thought that's behind it and stuff like that mm. so i do think there's a a deeper it comes from a deeper place if it's art in that way. And yet, not, right? And yet, it is only because you work so deeply and think so much that then that spontaneity, when it comes out, you know, I think Picasso said, you know, I, I spent, you have to spend a lifetime learning how to paint like a child again or something like that, right? This idea that 
you work so much with all this stuff that then can finally you can just draw a bull with your light, whatever, right? No, so that's like that. Definitely is a difference. I wouldn't call everything that everybody makes art. Yeah. I'm wondering if it's also linked to our perspective and judging and labeling, whereas creativity is just doing something, feeling this connection, feeling this flow. And then art, I also feel that it needs to be a bit recognized by others. Mm. Like if you just do this one thing and you sort of think it's fun, but no one sees it. I think this is what Nihali Chisengnihai, you know, who wrote Flow, oh, he yeah. also wrote a book called Creativity. And I think this is sort of what he's saying, but there are certain norms around art and therefore we can't just call anything we do art. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I think that begs the question of, do you help people then to unlock their inner artist or their inner creator? Because that's not the same. Interesting. Um, I think the deepest level of who we are, the person that is thinking and is seeing the world at a deep level is the inner artist. Um, I think the inner creator is like a, a playful part of that. And I do believe that if we're really going to develop on this inner journey that we're undertaking, then it is to find this artist because it demands a commitment and a thought and a, um, a depth that only come through, I don't know, you don't want to say hard work because it's not necessarily hard, but through real commitment to, to do something that is more important for yourself. So I, I believe that it's actually inner artist, but with lots of creative tools, right? Um, because we don't want to get make the technique get in the way. And then let's say for some people, let's say we, we are having a workshop with someone and we decide, oh, we're going to do intuitive painting. Now, none of that is meant to be good, right? It's not meant to be art that you hang on the wall or sell. People could if they wanted to, but that's not the point. The point is to start to get the momentum going. And to some people that might speak to them and then they work on becoming a painter. For other people, it might be um, the colors that come out and then they start being interested in how do I work with colors in fashion or something, right? Could be total. So I think, um, I think the tools are creative, but the inner artist is what we're aiming for awakening or working with. And it's a deeper, truer, authentic self. And what are some of the sabotages and obstacles that people have to getting in tune with their inner artist? Time, this idea of time and pressure to do stuff, right? Um, of course, societal pressures that we believe are important for us uh, that may or may not be. Um, not knowing what's important to you, not having your own internal values clear and what really is the key thing to you. Um, you know, and then there's a kind of maybe a host of other like, you know, family and stuff like that, that kind of could get in the way of, or become an obstacle for a person to dive into the stuff. Um, but then I think if we don't dive into it, then we're kind of missing who we are in a way. You said earlier that there was a, a link between meditation, sort of spiritual journey, let's say, and your artistic journey. I'd love to hear a bit more about that because I've also found that they're interconnected and they're one and the same somehow, that the, our creative energy is sort of the same as our spiritual energy, but I find it hard to formulate and I'd love to hear how you see them intertwined. So for a long time, um I felt like I had to separate, compartmentalize my stuff. So I put my spirituality here, I put my like art creation here, I did my kind of work over here, I had my friends over here, different groups of things. And as time has gone by and I start to go deeper into my understanding of who I am, I realized that that was just for some reason like a a fear-based way of, connect, of of compartmentalizing or keeping everything separate because I didn't know I didn't think it was going to interact because someone said oh to be successful you have to be driven or whatever it might be when I was a kid you know this kind of stuff and so I or you're a sport person you know you know whatever 
And, and then I think that um, they have to be actually intertwined. And it's only when I started to dare to say that um, I am working with spiritual stuff that other things like this podcast and other kinds of opportunities and things have opened up. So it's when I intertwine things that actually things start to blossom, right? And it's a strange thing that because you think that you got to keep everything separate if it's going to work. And even my kids who are, you know, now they're late teenagers, they're like, he's going to, you're going to go meditate. You know, I'm like, yeah. And they're like, good. I'm going to meditate too. Right. And I'm like, oh, nice. You know, that's good. Yeah, but not with you. You know, they're going to do their own thing. But they, they start to see that there's a way to connect. Right? And you, you can use that. People accept you when you stand for who you are. And if you don't allow yourself to intertwine those important things in your life, whatever they might be, then uh, I don't know if you're living fully. I think you know, you're missing something. So I would say don't be afraid of letting them. And they, in fact, they have to be intertwined. We can't keep everything separate. You know? And that's where uh, transparency and openness and honesty come in. Uh, and it's not easy sometimes. You, know? you don't want people to see uh, that we're vulnerable to see that we're unsure, but it's when we work with that stuff that actually people appreciate us and like us more and care about us and all that stuff and love us. And mm. You mentioned vulnerability right now and you didn't mention it in one of the obstacles, but I wonder, do you see this as a pattern that people are afraid of being vulnerable and opening up? Because being autistic or creative, I know I've had that a lot with my writing when I published my book, felt this huge fear mm. uh, more when it came out than while I was writing it. And I think there's a huge element of vulnerability around art and being creative. Yeah, definitely. Um, especially this idea, like there's a couple of things that come up. One is that people think, you know, you're wasting your time or why are you doing that? You know, no one's going to read your book. No one's going to look at your painting. Who cares? You know, you should be making money. You should, you know, go out with, did it make you any money? Do you sell that? You know? <laughs> And like you do some nice painting, like, oh, what'd you sell it for, right? And you're like, oh my God, you know, these people are like attacking you, right? So you got that side that is terrible, right? Um, you know, and they go right to that, they go right for it. You know, if you say, oh yeah, I just uh, published, but I have several books published too, right? And, I, and, and they, some might, someone that wants to like, it's like a pseudo friend, might say, oh yeah, well like, how's it work financially? You know, like that, how many do you sell? Oh yeah, it's like, you know, 2,000 books, yeah, that's $2 each, okay, that's like, what? yeah, you didn't make much money on that, did you? You know, things like that, right? You hear that stuff and you're like, oh, vulnerable. So you have to learn to ignore that stuff, right? Because it's in, you know, and at the same time, um, when you are vulnerable, then you find the people who really care about you are supportive and they open doors for you, they look after you, they make sure things really happen, you know, happen and unfold and all that kind of stuff. So I think vulnerability is essential to actually navigating the world really in a, in a positive way and to let ourselves be vulnerable and be seen for who we are really um, and to admit when we feel down or when we need help without being needy, obviously. And then um, to open ourselves up when we show what we're creating too because that's part of who we are and it's actually in the vulnerability that we that we that's the art that we like the most this is a strange thing it's in the it's when things aren't perfect that we like the thing you know it's the raspy voice or whatever it's the um the strange big you know fat opera singer that you don't even think could barely take any presence on stage or like makes your eyes water or whatever, you know, like Pavarotti singing or something. It's like, it's kind of like, it's the, if you look at like David Bowie, it's like the things that don't work that work, right? All these things, you know, that that's what makes it work. That's what makes it, oh, otherwise it would be like, you know, music 451 or whatever, you know, it'd be like this kind of just straightforward things all the time, but it's actually the quirks that make it interesting, you know? That's what makes us love stuff. And when you look at someone's face, it's not perfect symmetry, but it's, it's the things that are unique to them. That's what we really, really like and appreciate in other people and in ourselves too. But we forget that sometimes when we're being 
you know, making comparisons and being judgmental and all that kind of stuff. Mm. It's the vulnerability and the imperfection that makes it useful. Yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. If everything's absolutely perfect, whatever that means, then we kind of just pass it by. You know? Sterile. Yeah, sterile, you know? Boring. Yeah, boring. Yeah. You know, it's these quirky old buildings that everyone really likes. You know, we don't want this kind of like sterile car to... And that's why we don't want like a... Everyone doesn't want the same car even, you know, or the same clothing. We want the interesting thing that's different. You know? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I also think what you were saying right now with the people who asked, for example, financially how the book went obviously they're just repeating the pattern that they've heard and seen around them and yeah. i think until you're in touch with your own artist and your own process then you start to ask more what's the book about yeah <laughs> the really important <laughs> stuff right <laughs> yeah what's what is your premise what do you think about you know because it's what you think that's important and you're trying to express yourself through words in this case or if you're making a visual art through your visual art or you know through cooking you know that's why I don't like, so I love to cook, right? So I don't want people to cook for me who don't like to cook. They'll be like, oh, I'll cook for you, but I really don't like it. I'm like, do not cook for me ever. Because I would just be like, so I would just, I'll come over to your place, I'll cook. Just let me go. You know, because <laughs> you, know, you want people to do things they love, right? Yeah. And you want them to do the things that they love for you. Maybe they make the whole place really nice or whatever, you know, and you're like, oh, this is so beautiful. I love to come here and see how the flowers are and everything, you know. So we can compliment each other. We don't have to, you know, yeah, exactly. Yes. Find our, follow our, our bliss or whatever, <laughs> right? Yes, and encourage people to do the same. Yeah, follow your bliss. Do things that you love and try to make, share that. And that's what's important. That's what we should ask for other people. So it's not like, yeah, like how much do those flowers cost? I mean, it's ridiculous, right? You walk in like, oh, those flowers cost? It's like, wow, those are beautiful. How you put them together and created this, you know centerpiece whatever i'm like oh, i would never be able to do that no interest i'll be like except for appreciation right yeah it's mm. interesting yeah so it's what do we think and care about and how can we tune into someone else and ask what they think and care about yeah and yeah. i think from what you were saying it's there's sort of two elements there's really the the creator and then also artist which is deeper and then there's the sort of observer and appreciation like oh, a flower yeah. example or even when we said the shopping at the at the beginning where it's more passive in the sense that we're not actually doing something but it's also cultivating this observation awareness appreciation gratitude for what is around us and that's where meditation can help a lot because we become more aware of our surroundings and we pause a little more to see where we are and how things are going and what things look like and this helps us to appreciate it so I feel there's those two elements sort of the being and the doing again the yin and the yang the appreciation and the action definitely um when it comes to appreciation when you when you notice that just now um it wasn't something i had thought through and when you reflected that back to me i'm like it's so important you know that is like just just appreciating something that someone is offering to you is so big a part of the process, you know, absolutely. And it's, it's what makes us feel that we're willing to share our vulnerabilities and our uniqueness. And at the same time, it's a, a window into our own when we appreciate something else and appreciate what someone else has done. Then you're like, oh my God, this is like, it's opening a whole new landscape for me, you know, um, yeah. Interesting. Uh, yeah. It's interesting because I always love complimenting people. So if I see that they've done something really like, or I complimented your meditation class after All at right, the yeah. end, yeah. as soon as I participate in something I like, or I really like someone's clothes or hair, I stop women in the street to tell them how beautiful their hair is. And I think it is, now that we've had this conversation, I think it's my inner artist is touched and I feel that I want to express it and have that brief connection or, or longer if you know the person but if it's someone you don't know just to share that sort of depth and mm. it's a bit like you said you sort of showing the appreciation and then they also have a moment to maybe think about it and it's it's sort of a communication somehow a um, deeper connection yeah definitely and there i mean there's an art in appreciation i mean you master that right so that's part of the thing for other people when they feel seen it makes 
makes you feel wonderful when someone else sees you and that's just you know so true and if you can think if you're if you're look at something you can appreciate that and then express that and share that and have the courage to do that um that's yeah it's fantastic yeah, I work on the courage piece as one yeah, of my core, <laughs> core values. But I, I also think it's sometimes easier as a woman. Like if I speak to other women or men, they, they take it more easily. But I remember this one woman in the metro in London, I think, and she had these amazing bright blue eyes and she looked so sad. And she was young, but she just looked sad and her eyes were so blue. And then I told her in a very, like, trying not to be awkward way, you know, you have beautiful blue eyes that's all I wanted to say and her whole face lit up and she had tears in her eyes and I was like that's it and then I just went away to show I wasn't weird yeah. <laughs> but Which I is just, even more weird right? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, yes, <bye> -bye. <laughs> but then she was so happy and the, the interesting thing with compliments is that when they come to me I generally just want to share with them mm. but afterwards I have this whole inner glow myself yeah <laughs> it's like giving a gift right yeah and you're like I feel so good yeah, in yeah. fact, when they do these studies, uh, I can't remember exactly the study, the psychological study, but it's in the giving that we feel and remember the positive things that we've done that make a huge impact in later on and that we really care about. Um, and so that makes total sense, right? Mm -hmm. And if you, can th if you think and allow yourself intuitively to then offer that, it just, yeah, it's wonderful. That's an exact expression of being in touch with your inner artist. Yeah, yeah. Right. So what would you say, just to sort of wrap up, I think we covered a lot and we went quite in depth and I loved our topic around creativity versus art and then the inner artist, the inner creator and now this, these two as aspects, both the action and the appreciation. Mm -hmm. What would you say to someone listening who really wants to get a bit more in touch with the inner artist? What could be just a couple of things they could start to play with, to experiment, to help them to go a bit deeper on this journey? I'd say... Find something to do that you like and then do it. Um, that's one, one thing, right? Um, so be proactive, you know, find something. And I actually think that when you say this, um, this appreciation thing, I, I say that's, and that's part of this uh, being on a, uh, an artist's uh, uh, visit when you go to a place and you're gonna have an artist date. Um, and that is also to appreciate both in other people, but also the world around you, the art that you see, the things that you see, whether it's a flower that's growing in nature or whether it's the kind of thing that someone's created, to be appreciative of the things around you, you know, um, that touches into gratitude, which we know that gratitude and appreciation are sort of the f some of the fundamental um, cornerstones to well-being. You know, it's those things plus taking um, action, finding a... Um, uh, like inertia in the things that you do and finding that you can actually agency yeah make taking knowing that you kind of have a kind of a power within you to make something happen and so by taking action and by appreciating the world around you I think that's a beautiful starting point um, and then you know when we meditate if you if you're interested in meditating I think it's a wonderful way to center ground to give your body because when we when we meditate the most simple form we're allowing the body to uh, move from the fight or flight mechanisms that we have almost all the time when we're running around to come into the parasympathetic nervous system to allow ourselves to then um, relax the nervous system. The brain starts to higher uh, function at a higher level. And then we actually see the world in a different way just simply through the calmness of meditation. Then there's all kinds of different types of levels and styles of meditation that can help. But um, definitely some form of quietness during the day is great for you, yeah, or for us. Definitely. Yeah. <clears throat> definitely. I think meditation really helps us to shift our perspective, and it's easier than to be grateful mm. and to have that appreciation because you're in a calmer space. Mm. And it also, I think, helps you to build inner resilience because I've been preparing a keynote around resilience. Mm. And as I was doing this, I was thinking, well, meditation really helps because you detach a bit more from circumstances and you pause a bit and you sort of rebounce more easily and because you're not as reactive or to the external circumstance you have that that gap is a bit longer right before you answer back to the circumstance so with that pause you can choose 
yeah, response, right? It comes back to the Be Proactive and the Viktor Frankl and, oh, yeah, yeah. and then, then we're on to another two hour podcast. <laughs> we're moving away. We should do one on resilience. I'm curious to ask you about your resilience uh, oh, you yeah. know, keynote and all the yeah. things you got going on there yeah, too. Yeah. yeah. Well I'll probably do another solo show on uh, oh, good. resilience or also um, interview maybe one or two other people that are specialized in resilience. Yeah. yeah I look forward to seeing yeah, that. Yeah, it's like cliffhanger for the next <laughs> episode. <laughs> Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Gary, for being on the show today. I yeah, think we covered you. a lot. I think it's such an amazing topic. I think it's really fascinating. So thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you.